Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, I want to um, introduce uh, Dr. Deepak Panagrahi uh, from uh, the Center for Vascular Biology at uh, New England uh, Deaconess Beth Israel Medical Center in Boston. Um, and uh, uh, Deepak uh, got his MD from the high school to um, MD program at uh, Boston University. Uh, he's a physician scientist and trained as a surgeon at um, at, New, at New England Deaconess uh, Medical Center, um, and then went on to uh, Dr. Judah Folkman's lab, where uh, he uh, trained in uh, vascular biology and moved into a new area of the role of eicosanoids in um, in angiogenesis, and most recently has been working on the role of lipid uh, mediators um, that resolve inflammation. And today, um, Dr. Panagrai is going to talk about uh, the role of uh, tumor debris in uh, tumor progression. And I also just wanted to note that um, Deepak is also a great educator and has, um, uh, and two of the um, uh, trainees from his lab, um, Megan Sulsner and uh, Molly Gilligan, um, have become, uh, became medical students at the University of Minnesota. And, um, and I think Megan is now a, re a surgical resident at, uh, um, at um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And Molly's a third year medical student here at the U. So thank you for coming. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Um, University of Minnesota is fostering in a couple ways. I was going to do liver transplant. I worked with Roger Jenkins, did the first liver transplant in Boston, and this has always been a mecca for transplantation. There's very few labs in the country that really specialize. I'm going to talk about eicosanoids, bioactive lipid mediators, um, and David uh, and his lab in one of the leading labs, and that's how we met. Actually, there's a winter eicosanoid conference in Baltimore, and uh, so there's a couple areas in the country that can actually measure some of these lipid mediators that I'm going to talk about. Um, so it's great to be here. And then I'm going to show uh, Megan and Molly's work um, in the next couple of slides. Um, so my mentor for science purposes was Judah Folkman. So many of you may have heard of angiogenesis, the formation of blood vessels. And he really pioneered the concept in 1971 in a New England Journal publication, just the idea that tumors need blood vessels to grow. And that was a paradigm shifting concept because even though he focused on uh, at the endothelial cells, which are blood vessels are made up of endothelial cells and parasites. So before Dr. Folkman in the 1950s, 60s, with Sidney Farber and Dana Farber, it was attacking cancer only with chemotherapy and radiation. The idea to block and target a non-tumor cell back in the 70s was really a, a new concept. And it changed the thinking of cancer from a cell autonomous disease to a tissue developmental disease. And even though Dr. Folkman focused on endothelial cells and blood vessels, today we know the tumor stroma, which is basically the whole area of the tumor that's not a tumor cell, whether it's fibroblasts, neutrophils, lymphocytes, cancer stem cells, is very hot area. We know Nobel Prize last year was awarded for immunotherapy. And immunotherapy by activating T cells in your host system is now we're seeing cures in certain patients and certain subtypes that we never saw before. So it's a very exciting time to be in the cancer biology field. And uh, I'm going to talk about inflammatory cytokines. A lot of people are working on that area. But where we focus in are these small molecules called lipid autocoids. They're bioactive lipids. They can come from omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6 fatty acids. And eicosanoids are a term that's used for lipids that come from arachidonic acid. So I'll talk a little bit about that. We kind of got into the field uh, that cancer therapy paradoxically stimulates tumor growth via inflammation. And this is a concept many people don't realize that the therapy itself in a subset of patients can actually stimulate tumor growth, at least it's been shown in preclinical models. Uh, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, anesthesia, all can stimulate inflammation to stimulate tumor growth. And I'm going to talk about mainly chemotherapy and surgery. 
And then in the end, I'll talk a little bit also about environmental carcinogens, such as aflatoxin, which is a worldwide problem. And we're interested in how alcohol can stimulate cancer. Um, so a lot of times in science, you just have to go back in history because you think you're the first one to think of something, but actually um, there's really pioneering studies done a long time ago. This was 1956 Nature paper. Laszlo Revez, a radiation oncologist from Hungary, actually had the idea that could you stimulate tumor growth with debris, he, apoptotic tumor cells? So you have to know the whole goal in cancer therapy over the past 100 years has been to stimulate cell death, to stimulate apoptotic tumor cells. And he showed that when he radiated the tumor cells, it created apoptotic tumor cells, and paradoxically, that stimulated tumor growth. So normally, you need about a million cancer cells to stimulate a tumor in mice, and he would take about 10,000 cancer cells co-inject them with radiation uh, apoptotic cells, and that stimulated tumor growth. It's called the Revez phenomenon. And then below here, you can see these are just a couple of papers, but multiple groups have reproduced this finding. And it's mainly stayed in the radiation field. And this was actually an editorial in Nature Medicine in 2011, the downside to apoptosis and cancer therapy. And the radiation will uh, kill the tumor activate caspases, which are apoptotic enzymes, create apoptotic cell death, activate phospholipase 2, which will stimulate a, a lipid called prostaglandin E2, and that will stimulate tumor growth. So they call it this, the editorial was a downside to apoptosis and cancer therapy. So the radiation field has known about this, and we were interested, well, chemotherapy induces apoptotic cell death. Could that be a kind of a, a detrimental part of chemotherapy? So we've been interested in what's responsible for therapy failure in many tumor types, as you know, like ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, brain tumor, where you have chemotherapy, and it may work for a couple months. In ovarian cancer, it could be one to two years, but in 70, 80% of cases with advanced stage cancer, the tumor comes back. So we were interested, does this tumor debris, which is apoptotic tumor cells, necrotic cells, uh, cell fragments, could that result in debris? Could that debris um, actually stimulate tumor growth? The current paradigm is that the tumor cell apoptosis is either inert or actually inhibitory. In fact, people use the dead cells as cancer vaccines to stimulate dendritic cells as an anti-tumor. Um, so, could apoptotic cell death from chemotherapy or even targeted therapy like cetuximab or lotinib? or antiangiogenic therapy, or even immunotherapy, uh, CAR-T therapy can stimulate cell death. So chemotherapy and radiation can directly induce cell death, but antiangiogenic therapy, immunotherapy, indirectly stimulates cell death. And basically, we hypothesize based on the Revez phenomenon that the chemotherapy generated debris could stimulate tumor growth. We've been interested, I'm going to talk about these uh, lipid mediators, and they're downstream products of the omega-6 fatty acids or the omega-3 fatty acids. So the omega-6 fatty acids, which is an arachidonic acid, in we've shown and other people have shown if you pretreat mice in metastatic models, these are all lung metastases that the omega-6 can actually stimulate metastasis. And it's been long been targeted that arachidonic acid can stimulate metastasis. So the whole goal for the last 50 years has been to block pro-inflammatory factors. In the eicosanoid field, it was mainly prostaglandin E2, leukotriene B4. In the inflammation world, it was TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, or chemokines. Um, the reverse, what we've been looking at is omega-3 fatty acids are actually anti-inflammatory in preclinical models. And we looked at the downstream metabolites, and I'm going to talk about the resolvins. These are immunoresolvin agonists. So rather than blocking a pro-inflammatory factor, could we stimulate natural endogenous pro-resolving, which means clearing debris, anti-inflammatory factors in the body. And we use these as agonists, so we're not blocking pro-inflammatory factors. And the goal is to inhibit the uh, cancer metastasis. So we've had a couple publications over the past year. And being here is very special because, as I mentioned, two lab members who've really been um, big parts of our lab, um, Megan uh, came to our lab right after Boston College around um, and her mom actually is in the back. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. And she comes from a history of, um, of scientists. And, uh, and when she graduated Boston College, uh, 
most of the Harvard Medical School professors look after the, the best postdocs and the best graduate students. So if you're a young lab just starting out, you know, on, you have a small lab, it turns out, I learned this over the years, that the, probably the best people to get in the lab are your talented college students who graduate and want to go to medical school or graduate school. And so Megan came in, really, we challenged her, and I'm going to show some of her paper that was published here at Journal of Experimental Medicine. And then Molly followed in her footsteps as a third year medical student at the U of M. And I'll talk a little bit about her PNS paper on aspirin triggered pro-resolving mediators. I'm mainly gonna talk about two approaches to block the resolution of cancer. And one is through surgery, which was our recent JCI paper. If you block the resolution of inflammation right before surgery, we could prevent uh, metastases in the subset of mice. And then I'll talk about this paper is another approach to stimulate resolution of cancer by blocking pro-inflammatory um, lipid mediators from the COX-2 pathway. Um, one of the interests we had in the Folkman lab was to mimic tumor dormancy in mice. And the reason why that's important is that there are uh, classic studies in 1985 done in Finland, and these autopsy studies done on, on people who died in car accidents um, showed that over 98% of people have dormant thyroid cancer. And the pathologist would actually uh, section the thyroid and then in a blinded way look for microscopic metastasis. And it was pretty shocking that that many people had a dormant micrometastases. Uh, dormancy is, is defined even in mice that you have proof of a cancer. So the tumor cell is there, it may be proliferating, but it's not an actively growing cancer. That's why it remains dormant. And 30 to 40 percent of women or men have dormant breast or prostate cancers. And in the mice, we make we have dormant module, uh, dormant tumors, in which the nodule is detectable after a uh, hundred days as a mass. So it's proliferating, but it's not growing. It's not angiogenic, and the immune system may be rejecting it. Um, so we've mimicked that in different models. This is one example. For example, this is Lewis lung carcinoma, a very aggressive mouse tumor that grows in immune competence C57 mice. These are black mice. So when you inject a million tumor cells, Lewis lung carcinoma, in mice, that's what most academic labs and industry do because you're evaluating anti-cancer drugs. So this tumor will grow to 2,000 cubic millimeters in three weeks. If you reduce the inoculum to 100,000 cells, the mouse will reach a tumor in about one month, 2,000 cubic millimeters. But it turns out if you inject a subthreshold inoculum, which is either 10,000 cells or 1,000 cells, which is what Revez did in the Revez phenomenon, that half the mice will grow tumors at 10,000 cells. And the other half, we can see here, have these dormant tumors, which right under the skin, which is right here, you can barely see this white nodule, and that's the dormant tumor, it just sits there. Or at a thousand cells, it doesn't even grow a tumor. So we asked the question, does tumor debris from chemotherapy stimulate tumor growth or tumor dormancy escape? And this was one of the first questions that Megan did when she was in the lab, that she injected a subthreshold inoculum, which these are 10,000 or 1,000 tumor cells, and then co-injected with the cell debris, which was in vitro created by chemotherapy, which will create apoptotic and necrotic cells. And we co-inject that in the same site in the mice, uh, either subcutaneously in orthotopic setting. And uh, one of the things I have to mention too, and uh, Dan may get a little embarrassed here, but she, part of, we always wonder what motivated Megan. And Jan is on the uh, wall of fame here at the medical school. And her nature paper in the HIV fail was cited 2,000 times. So we kind of started to understand that Megan's following some big footsteps here. And so one of the very first experiments Megan did was to take, um, in this particular case, it's cisplatin, but we ended up doing multiple chemotherapies. And you create debris. So when you inject the tumor debris alone, here, 900,000 cells, the tumors never grew. And that's what Revez showed when you only inject the apoptotic debris or the necrotic debris, you don't get a tumor. But when you inject just the living cells alone, you get a tumor, but it only in half the mice. You can see here 10,000 living cells. But when you dose-dependently increase the amount of debris, you can get an, a dose-dependent increase in tumor growth. And at 900,000 cells plus the 10,000 living, if you co-inject in the same site, we would get rapid tumor growth. This was Lewis lung 
in a C57 mouse, but we ended up doing human tumors in skid mice, and uh, it was not dependent on a particular chemotherapy. And then when this paper was in review in Nature for about 18 months after two sets of revisions and trying to answer about 60 questions, um, Megan actually did a really cool experiment. So the paradigm in the field is necrotic debris is, is uh, pro-inflammatory and will stimulate pro-inflammation. So everyone thought that necrotic debris had to be more potent than apoptotic debris. In fact, this really surprised the reviewers. So we just did a very cool experiment, just sorted the apoptotic cells, which is anexin-5 positive, PI negative, versus the, nexin, the necrotic debris, which is anexin-5 PI positive. And surprisingly, the apoptotic debris was more potent than the necrotic debris in stimulating tumor growth. And necrotic debris eventually did stimulate tumor growth, but we had to increase the number of cells. And so, and this was consistent with the radiation field that apoptotic debris could stimulate tumor growth. And then we showed that this would, you know, we're worried, is this an in vitro artifact? Is it just an in vitro phenomenon? So the, another experiment Megan did was to actually give the chemotherapy systemically. So if you treat a growing tumor, you get an anti-tumor effect. That's why people get chemotherapy because it can benefit a certain set of patients. But in a dormant cancer setting, if you give the chemotherapy here, you can see a stimulation of tumor growth. And other groups are now showing that chemotherapy in a certain setting, certain dormant settings, and can actually stimulate tumor growth. And we showed there was an increase in cell death with the chemotherapy. Uh, and then Jamie in our lab actually looked into a further mechanism with the, the chemotherapy. In this case, it's 5-fluorouracil part of fulfinox, which is given for colon cancer and pancreatic cancer. And if you treat at only 10,000 cells, which is the subthreshold inoculum, and you start treating on day zero, the chemotherapy stimulates the tumor growth. And since tumor growth is angiogenesis dependent, we looked at could the increase be because of tumor angiogenesis. And here you can see CD31 staining for the endothelial cells. And in the chemotherapy treated tumor, you see a lot of blood vessels. And there's an increased microvessel density. So the five fluorouracil, the chemotherapy stimulated the tumor angiogenesis. So if the debris from chemotherapy or even radiation contributes to therapy resistance, how can it be cleared? And this is where we started a very exciting collaboration with Charles Serhan uh, at the Brigham because he was basically had a new approach to find lipids that would clear debris by stimulating macrophages to eat debris. Uh, history. Traditional anti-inflammatories do not clear debris. They're basically geared toward blocking pro-inflammatory factors, whether it's steroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, or blocking cytokines. And they come with serious side effects. So steroids are immunosuppressive. Um, the last thing you want to do in a cancer patient is suppress their immune system, and then they can't fight other cancers or infections. Um, Non-steroidals have potent anti-inflammatory activity. 1982, Bent Samuelson won the Nobel Prize for aspirin-blocking prostaglandins. And Serhan, who I'm going to talk about, was a postdoc in the Samuelson lab. So it was, you know, it was, it was a big deal and says blocking inflammation, but they have side effects. Same thing with cyclooxygenase inhibitors. They were, it was hot for a while, but then it turned out patients were having heart issues. And in cancer trials, COX inhibitors have pretty much failed in the clinical trials. And blocking cytokines in clinical trials really hasn't produced sustained activity in cancer trials. And the other problem I'm going to get into, cancers can generate a series of pro-inflammatory factors. So it's hard to develop neutralizing antibodies for um, eight or 10 different pro-inflammatory factors. So we've been interested in approaches that instead of block the pro-inflammatory factors, will turn off the inflammation. And then you could um, block a series of, of pro-inflammatory factors. So to clear the debris, we're interested in phagocytosis. This is a macrophage eating the debris, the dead cells. Other cells in the body can also stimulate phagocytosis, dendritic cells, neutrophils. But we focus on the macrophage. They're called the big eaters. They're kind of like the Pac-Man. They eat the debris. And healthy individuals, more than 10 billion cells die every day. Uh, so your apoptotic bodies are cleared every day by phagocytes, clears the body of unwanted cellular debris. This is called ephrocytosis. 
the process by which dying cells are removed by the phagocyte. So we were interested in lipids that would stimulate macrophage phagocytosis of debris and stimulate this process of efferocytosis. So in 1984, when Serhan was in Samuelson's lab, when Samuelson won the Nobel Prize, he actually, him and Samuelson asked the reverse question, what turns inflammation off? Instead of blocking pro-inflammatory factors, could you find bodies, um, factors that it produces that will turn inflammation off? These are the stop signals, endogenous controllers of inflammation. And he called them the pro-resolving mediators. And uh, Fleming um, had written, if the soil causes the disease, the cure to the disease also lies in it. And what was really clever is they used inflammatory exudates to discover these pro-resolving mediators. They basically did unbiased mass spec as the inflammation is resolving in inflammation assays and um, discovered what are the lipids responsible for the inflammation being turned off. And these specialized pro-resolving mediators in 2000, 2002, the Serhan lab, uh, lab discovered the E-series resolvents, which come from EPA, the omega-3 fatty acid. D-series resolvents come from DHA, these are omega-3 fatty acids. The protectins come from DHA. Those are very important in the brain where there's a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. And the marisins are macrophage-derived pro-resolving mediators. And these are not, these are very different from anti-inflammatories. Um, currently, if you use anti-inflammation, you can block pro-inflammatory cytokines, but you have to block a, a particular one. The SPMs is what they're called, specialized pro-resolving mediators, SPMs. They block neutrophil recruitment, PMN recruitment, and they block the leukocytes from coming into the tumor. Um, they counter a series of cytokines and chemokines. But what was very exciting is that they stimulate macrophage phagocytosis. And that's where we really uh, joined forces with the Serhan lab to show that the macrophages can eat the debris when we treat the tumors and the mice with the tumors with these resolvents. So in this particular model that Megan had developed, this is a debris stimulated pancreatic cancer model using gemcitabine, the current can cancer chemotherapy. You can see in control tumors, the tumors grow to about 2,000 after 30 days of treatment. But when we treat with chemotherapy and conventional anti-inflammatories at gram per day doses, the tumors escape, while the resolvents at only nanogram uh, concentrations, 10,000 fold lower, you can see the size difference. Uh, we had a, a, a potent anti-tumor effect. Eventually the tumors did grow, so we had to combine the resolvents with other therapies, and I'll get into immunotherapy and chemotherapy. And so the mechanism we showed in, in Megan's paper that the resolvents at nanomolar concentrations can increase macrophage phagocytosis more potently than conventional anti-inflammatories like dexamethasin, indomethacin. And they increase the ephrocytosis, which is the eating of the debris by the macrophages. In this case, Megan did a triple stain. The tumor cells are labeled with GFP. This is B16F10 melanoma. The macrophages are labeled with F480, a macrophage marker. And then there are different ephrocytosis markers, in this case, TIM4. And the resolvents would increase the the ephrocytosis uh, marker. And in this case, instead of blocking a particular one cytokine, what we found is the debris in increased four of the five cytokines. That's the black compared to the gray. Um, only in IL-6, we didn't see an increase. But in IL-8, TNF-alpha, CCL-4, CCL-5, which are all potently pro-tumorigenic factors, the debris stimulates the increase in the uh, cytokine and the resolvents can block that. It doesn't go to zero, so you can see why the tumor would come back eventually, but instead of using neutralizing antibodies to each one, with just one uh, dose of the resolvents in vitro would block this uh, debris-stimulated cytokine uh, stimulation. We end up in a future paper calling it the cytokine storm. Um, so this is chemotherapy. What about surgery? So in parallel, we were asking the question with, um, Dr. Serhan and actually Vika Sukhatmi, who's now the Dean of Emory Medical School when he was at the Beth Israel, that surgery, it's well known, can stimulate inflammation, can stimulate angiogenesis and cell debris. And, and it's well known surgery can stimulate tumor growth in preclinical models. If you go back to 1914, and actually there's even older papers, but when you inject tumor cells, if you create some injury, in this case a rod, the tumor will home in on the injury site. 
because tumor growth is next to surgical placement of glass rods. So the tumor is increased chance of getting to a particular site if you do wound injury, wound and an injury. And you're gonna see this theme of injuring a site will predispose to cancer. And this happened very often. The classic paper in the field is the Fisher brothers um, from the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Fisher passed away about a month ago at age 100, won Alaska award. And before him, the whole approach to breast cancer was just take it all out and uh, massive uh, surgery. But then he showed that surgery itself can have detrimental effects. This was, uh, this was 1959, he, um, they injected dormant, they injected 50 Walker cancer cells into rat in the portal vein. And if you let the rats alone for five months and you only inject a subthreshold inoculum, kind of like how we inject only 10,000 cells, nothing happens to the rats. But if you subject the same rats to multiple laparotomies starting at three months, every couple of weeks, and the laparotomy means you sleep the rat, you open up the muscle, expose the intestine, take it out for five minutes, close, put the intestine back and just close the rat. So you don't do anything else except just a laparotomy just the act of surgery would stimulate tumor dormancy escape. And this has now been shown in about eight different papers. Um, a, a cool paper recently was they found zebrafish that hit the walls on their cage were predisposed to melanoma. So there's something about injury and surgery that can stimulate tumor growth. Uh, and these are in preclinical models. The other worrisome part for cancer patients who, when they go into surgery, it's been well now documented that Certain anesthetic drug, drugs like sodium pentothal, morphine, opioids can stimulate tumor growth. This was a, a paper from 1981. It turns out morphine can stimulate cancer stem cells, stimulate angiogenesis, can stimulate tumor growth. So now many uh, centers, um, for example, the University of Pittsburgh, there's clinical trials where the cancer patients don't get exposed to opioids and they get, for example, a COX-2 inhibitor, a lidocaine, and comparing um, the effects on not using opioid. So that kind of inspired our paper, which was just published this past July, where in preclinical models, we asked the question where if you do chemotherapy or surgery, now other groups have shown that the inflammation can stimulate tumor dormancy escape, and you do get a transient reduction of tumor mass, but what happens if you can block the inflammation before surgery? And that's what we did. We used actually Ketorolac, which is an interesting drug, it's tordal, it's non steroidal, and it actually increases the SPM. So in a screening assay, we've been screening which drugs increase the resolvance and the lipoxin. So that's how we got interested in ketorolac. And actually, breast cancer surgeons have noticed that women over the years in retrospective studies who were given tordal had a lower risk of cancer, but that was a retrospective study. So we gave the ketorolac right for the surgery or we give uh, the resolvents right before surgery, or we give it at the time of chemotherapy, and then we could uh, prolong survival in a subset of mice. And so the model, one of the models we use is this Lewis lung carcinoma on the back of mice, where if you put this tumor on the back of the mouse and you remove it, paradoxically, three weeks later, you get an explosion of lung metastasis. This was a cover of cell 1994 from the Folkman lab. On day zero, you can see microscopic metastases. So it mimics a patient with a dormant cancer who's having their surgery removed. It turns out the mechanism for this uh, explosion of metastasis, you lose angiogenesis inhibitors such as angiostatin. So paradoxically, when you remove a tumor, you can actually remove some of the tumor inhibitory molecules. So that's in this particular Lewis lung resection model at day zero, we pre-treated the mice with omega-3 fatty acids and aspirin and we got prolongation of survival. You can see omega-6, the, the mice don't last as long. They go about three weeks. We're interested in aspirin because aspirin can trigger the resolvins. And Molly's PNS paper this past year showed that um, one of the uh, mechanisms of how aspirin is, is anti-tumor is through the resolvins. Molly blocked uh, aspirin anti-tumor activity with um, genetic knockouts of the resolvin receptor to show that uh, aspirin can trigger resolvins. But as you can see, the mice eventually passed away. So we asked, what about giving the pure resolvins themselves? And that's what uh, Molly and Megan uh, helped do. In this particular model, Lewis lung carcinoma, we do the laparotomy like the Fisher experiment at day zero. And you can see surgery, laparotomy compared to no surgery stimulates tumor growth. But at the time of surgery, we actually in, insert a mini osmotic pump with resolvins. 
and um, can basically delay the tumor from coming back. And now with Bob Langer and Charlie Serhan, we're actually, and Henry Brem at the Hopkins, we're trying to, at the time of surgery with patients, for example, brain cancer, put the resolve in, in mini osmotic pumps at the, type, type, at the time of surgery. This is an aggressive pancreatic cancer model where at the time of surgery, we inject the, the tumors right into the pancreas and then get liver metastasis. And we can uh, we get survival to 40% long term. We're very interested in Fanconi anemia, uh, which is um, for those of you who know in this defect of uh, the Fanc C minus minus. Um, these patients is basically kids that get 700 fold increased chance of getting head and neck cancer, and they get leukemia. And actually, May and Amali were presenting at the ACR meeting, and the Fanconi people were walking around, and it turns out they don't have many good mouse models of Fanconi anemia, and they were interested in the resolvents because Fanconi anemia, you have increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, you have a defective phagocytosis. So we were interested in stimulating resolution. And so basically we created the, basically the world's first immunocompetent transplantable Fanconi anemia model. And to do that, we had to get patient tumors, grow them in a, uh, in a mouse, put them back to culture, grow them in a mouse, and you just recycle multiple times. That's how like the filler lab made B16F10. You just go back from a mouse to a dish and then back to a mouse. And so we made a Fanconi anemia transplantable model and we gave resolvins and the immunotherapy PD-1. And basically in orthotopic tongue tumors, we could get additive activity with resolution and immunotherapy. Um, so what I've been showing you so far is kind of current therapy, such as surgery, chemotherapy, and in the Revez phenomenon, radiation, uh, stimulating inflammation to, to cause the tumor to come back in preclinical models. But what's also a problem in inflammation, which is a hallmark in cancer, when Hanahan Weinberg did their re-update on the uh, hallmarks of cancer, inflammation was added to it. And inflammation can actually s initiate tumor growth in preclinical models. So if you don't have inflammation in certain cancer models, like pancreatic cancer, you don't get the cancer. Um, but what was here even more remarkable and what we've been interested in is inflammation as a risk factor. So if you have hepatitis, we know in like in Asia, it's a huge problem. These patients who have hepatitis who get liver cancer, um, alcohol, which I talked a little bit about, patients can get increased chance of getting esophageal, liver cancer, smoking and pancreatic cancer. Ulcerative colitis, you have a five to 10% chance of getting uh, colon cancer, that's a huge problem. You could be in your 30s or 40s, have this inflammatory bowel disease, and the surgeon's gonna say, the current treatment is just take your colon out. Or you have to just get evaluated once a year with this kind of worry about potentially getting a cancer. And then what we got interested in environmental carcinogens, what I'm gonna talk about. So we just asked the question, a chemo preventative setting, could we turn off the resolution of inflammation? Because these are non-toxic lipids. This isn't chemotherapy, it's like immunotherapy where the side effects aren't as big. And in fact, when Molly's paper came out, the chief of the National Cancer Institute Chemo Prevention Department wrote to us and they, they wanted to make resolvents at their facility and give it to patients because as you can see, there's a certain setting where chemo prevention would be very ideal. So we've been asking the question beyond chemotherapy and targeted therapy and radiation, can the induction of apoptotic cell debris increase the risk of cancer. I'm just gonna to touch on a little bit, a couple of different projects going on in the lab. Uh, I've always been interested in transplant because I was gonna do liver transplant. And there's this, um, you always wanna base some of your research in the lab on some clinical findings that just aren't explained because you know it's a real biology. And one is cyclosporin in transplant patients can increase cancer through cell autonomous mechanisms. There's a nature paper showing that. So why do, certain patients who get transplants have an increased risk of cancer. So that's an un, really not known mechanism. And then how do carcinogens increase cancer? It's mainly thought through genotoxic mechanism of DNA damage, but are there non-genotoxic mechanisms? And then alcohol is, um, we got interested mainly because there's actually an RFA for anyone interested on the NCI whenever they have unanswered questions. So their current RFA is uh, alcohol stimulates cancer. What's the mechanism? 
Um, so in this case, cyclosporin, Haisha in the lab, created epithelial. This is now, we're talking about non-tumor debris. This is not cancer debris. These are non-cancer cells. She added it to, um, this particular line is the lymphoma cell line, and she, get, she could get stimulation of tumor growth. If you add just the dead cells from cyclosporin, no tumor growth, but the cyclosporin co-injected with the, uh, the cyclosporin debris co-injected with the lymphoma living cells, and you get stimulation of tumor growth. And Anna did the same thing with aflatoxin B1. This is a fungus that's actually in peanut butter. It's in nuts at very low levels in this country, so it's not much of a problem here. But in Asia, India, China, and stuff, this is a huge problem with. Um, and we actually got interested on uh, the Bill Gates Foundation um, has been interested in this, and we're trying to work with them and Bob Langer on could we prevent carcinogen-induced cancer in Asia. And um, so basically, the aflatoxin debris plus the living cancer cells stimulate tumor growth. Um, and then this was actually a side finding. When we were doing uh, prednisone stimulated debris, the vehicle for the prednisone was alcohol. And then Haisho told me like multiple times that ethanol debris stimulate tumor growth. And we kind of just buried it where we were like, oh, you know, well, this must be some weird control. And it wasn't actually until the RFA that alcohol stimulates tumor growth where we look back and the ethanol debris, which is basically any drug that's cytotoxic can create debris. Debris is just cell death, whether it's apoptotic and necrotic. And so we've been very interested in alcohol. And um, the other unanswered question, how do women who are getting tamoxifen for breast cancer get endometrial cancer? And what's uh, about 6% of uh, women who are on tamoxifen have an increased chance of endometrial cancer? And the lab also showed when we co-injected tamoxifen debris uh, with uh, the living endometrial cells, we could get stimulation of tumor growth. So it's a, a project, we're, ongoing project, work in progress we're working on. So Molly did one of um, key experiments as far as the mechanism with pro-inflammatory cytokines. She compared, this is now chemotherapy debris. Lewis lung and EL4 are tumor cells, so that's tumor debris. But then she compared mela C as melanocyte line, so non-tumor debris, NIH 3T3 is fibroblast and primary fibroblasts. And you can see prime, we always worry about cell lines being an artifact. So really the real experiment is you take primary cells from the same mouse that you got the tumor from. So these are primary fibroblasts isolated from C57 black mice. And then what she did is just killed the, the cells with chemotherapy and just exposed the macrophages here. You can see macrophages alone can generate some cytokines, but not too many. And the debris alone, you don't get any cytokines. But when you expose the debris and, and the macrophages, you get what we call the cytokine storm. And you can see here TNF, uh, CCL2, IL-6. These are very potently protumorigenic molecules. So what was interesting is that primary fibroblast debris exposed to the chemotherapy stimulated these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is clinically relevant. There are many there is cancer patients who have their tumor removed, for example, ovarian cancer. And then supposedly you have no cancer and you get six cycles of carboplatin paclitaxel. So the fact that chemotherapy can stimulate a potently protumorigenic molecules in somebody who has, you know, in this case, macrophages, is a little bit of a scary concept. Um, so we've been going through different approaches, not just resolvents. So in parallel, we've been looking for kind of drugs that increase resolvents. And it turns out one of our close collaborators is Bruce Hammock, who's a National Academy member at UC Davis. Sung He is a pharmacologist in his lab. And so arachidonic acid can be metabolized by three different main enzyme systems, COX, which is cyclooxygenase, to prostaglandins, lipoxygenase to heats, and the CYP-P450s, which is how David and I met in the Baltimore meeting, we're both interested in these EETs, I'll call them, epoxycosatrinoic acids. It turns out the soluble epoxide hydrolase blocks the enzyme that de degrades the ETs. And so if you block the SEH, the ETs are anti-inflammatory. You can increase the um, anti-inflammatory part of this pathway. And it turned out what Hammock Lab showed, if you block one pathway, that arachidonic acid can shunt to other pathways, which is a problem in cancer therapy. In fact, COX inhibitors and LOX inhibitors have failed in clinical cancer trials. Um, so they've been interested in blocking multiple pathways. So this dual COX-2 SEH inhibitor is combining like Celebrex, which is COX-2 inhibitor, and the SEH inhibitor in 1770, and it forms one dual compound. 
And what was exciting is that the dual compound was more potent than either one alone in their pain and inflammation assays. So when Allison was in the lab, she basically designed uh, a therapy using the COX-2 SCH inhibitor. And she, what she did, she took macrophages alone. Here you see the raw macrophages. We confirmed this with perineal macrophages and human um, macrophages from the blood bank. When you add the debris here, you can see the second column, you get the cytokine storm, this paclitaxel ovarian cancer debris. And then when she used five micromolar of P-tub, you can see she pretty much wiped out the cytokine storm. In fact, the only molecule we would see there is IL-1-RA, which is actually the natural endogenous anti-inflammatory uh, counterpart of IL-1-A. So in some ways, IL -1 -RA, of IL-1. So IL-1-RA can actually be protective. And then in the orthotopic tumor model, you can see the orthotopic means you inject the tumor cells right into the organ. So in, in, in ovarian cancer, you inject it right into the mouse ovary. We could see a reduction in tumor growth. Um, so in pancreatic cancer, uh, Anna did gemcitabine-generated debris. You can see an increase in cytokines, VEGF, MMP9, and then PTUB would block most of the cytokines. Um, Osteopontin SDF1 was still there. And the same thing with the inflammatory cytokine arrays. You can see PTUB would block this cytokine storm, except for one of the pro-inflammatory factors. So what was similar to the resolvins and PTUB and other pro-resolution mechanisms were trying to block a series of cytokines and stimulate macrophage eating a debris. And uh, this is just current work and it's doing with the aflatoxin debris. You can see the cytokine storm, the PTUB, and debris alone, you can see you don't get any, any cytokines. Um, and this is the angiogenic cytokine profile. You can see the PTUB blocks most of the cytokines in the angiogenic profile, uh, except for osteopontin. Uh, in this case, she did ethanol generate liver debris. Well, she's, you get a cytokine storm here, and then the PTUB pretty much blocks it out. Uh, the cytokine storm. And what was interesting, when we gave either compound alone, this is the newest Bruce Hammock SEH inhibitor called OM21I. It was actually designed as a COX-1 inhibitor and an SEH inhibitor based on our data showing COX-1 inhibitor, which I'm not going to get into, was more potent than COX-2 inhibitor, but it turned out it didn't block COX-1, but it still is pretty potent. And when she combined with the SEH inhibitor plus the Celebrex, we could get uh, blocking of the cytokines, which is which is really exciting because, as I said, Celebrex alone um, hasn't worked in the clinic. And the PTUB can stimulate macrophage phagocytosis of the debris. In this case, it's raw macrophages um, and the uh, or peritoneal macrophages, and it's micromolar concentration. So we're excited that pro-resolution, rather than blocking anti-inflammatory factors, will stimulate clearing of the debris by macrophages and counter-regulate a series of pro-tumorigenic cytokines. So as far as clinical trials, we're also, cancer trials take, you know, five, 10 years. You need a company to give like 10 to $50 million. So it takes a long time. Um, but there are other indications of the cytokine storm that are quicker. So CAR T therapy, uh, some of the patients actually get this cytokine storm. In fact, the very first one with CAR T therapy overnight in the ICU at CHOP, they had to give neutralizing antibodies to IL-6 because the girl went into shock and stuff. So it turned out Dana-Farber, graft versus host disease with the stem cell transplantation, a subset of those patients get the cytokine storm. So we're working with those um, oncologists to give the resolvents at the time of the graft versus host disease when they get the cytokine storm. And Bruce Hammack is now uh, with the Bill Gates Foundation, we're targeting all the malaria, pancreatitis, hepatitis, uh, all these other diseases. So just to summarize here, the last few slides, that anesthetics during surgery and surgery itself in preclinical models, opioids, and I didn't get into biopsy. We also showed, and other groups are now showing, when you biopsy a preclinical model induces inflammation, and the treatment in some groups have been to give indomethacin right before the biopsy. Um, but it stresses the biopsy, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. This, cause the common link is they stress the cells out, increase tumor dormancy escape, and we're trying to block that tumor dormancy escape with the pro-resolution mediators. So our studies, and this is all in preclinical models, um, um, that resolution inflammation can complement current cancer therapies that inevitably will generate cell debris. And we're currently trying to use it in the chemo prevention setting for alcohol 
and carcinogen induced cancers in a preclinical setting. Um, so what about humans? My last two slides are just human data. Loss of resolution, reduced SPM. This is all in patients, atherosclerosis, dry eye, arthritis, obese patients, Alzheimer's, smokers, periodontal disease. We now have a, a manuscript that Megan and Molly helped with in brain cancer where you get lots of, of SPMs and we're correlating the loss of resolving receptors to how the glioblastoma patients do. And as far as clinical trials, these lipid mediators um, are very fast acting. So they have a very quick half-life. So in clinical trials, you actually use an analog. So these resolving protectant lipoxin it's actually an analog uh, of resolving E1 that's in clinical trials for eczema, dry eye disease as a, a topical uh, eye drop, periodontal disease as a gum uh, spray, and the protectins, neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and lipoxin, gingivitis, and eczema. And now we're really uh, trying to get to cancer uh, with a couple companies. And then just to acknowledge, this is the lab. Here's Megan. And um, this is the Serhan lab here. It's been an amazing collaboration. They have two program project grants to study non-cancer disease. So we're kind of their cancer uh, angle. And then Bruce Hammock, we've had really close collaboration with. And then happy to take questions. Um, questions, comments? Yeah. So I've got a question about how this works potentially with immunotherapy. So when I'm thinking about how immunotherapy usually works for cancer, you want to drive Th1, Th17 and not get Tregs. My understanding is that these resolvins promote differentiation of regulatory T cells, which you would normally think of as um, pro-tumor. And I'm wondering, you know, does that actually happen when you give the resolvins? Do you promote these types of subset changes in T cells? And is it is possibly one mechanism to explain this is that do the resolvins perhaps prevent T cell exhaustion? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually, so the Seren Lab actually has a paper that the MDSCs and the went up with, with in their models, non-cancer models. And in our models, MDSCs promote cancer. So there's a little paradox here. So we're, we haven't really studied the mechanism of the T cells yet. Uh, we focus on macrophages. So from the macrophage point of view, we were a little puzzled because they increase M2 macrophages, and M2 was thought to be pro-tumor and M1 anti-tumor. But it turned out, and what Megan and Molly showed is that it was the, a subset of phagocytic macrophages that went up, and then um, they showed an increase in epicytosis macrophages. So up to date, we've only focused mainly on the macrophage mechanism. That this paper with immunotherapy and the resolvents, we've really now we're just starting to get a little bit into the mechanism. Um, the receptors are expressed on T cells and B cells for the SPMs. Uh, but what it seems like in the cancer models, the inflammation is a little different from the non-cancer models. Um, but we're very puzzled too, because according to the non-cancer paper, you're absolutely right, the MDSCs go up with resolvents. So we, the short answer is we don't know the mechanism of how resolvents and immunotherapy would be synergistic, except just a simple, the, res, the immunotherapy does increase the cytokines and creates this debris and the resolvents can clear it, but we haven't shown that in the, in the combination immunotherapy and resolvents. Anyone else? He answered all your yeah. questions. Um, interesting talk. I was just kind of curious about kind of um, have have you able to kind of think about like tumor heterogeneity in terms of like when you take cell debris because I guess the mouse model is very much kind of like a homogeneous genetic sort of background, right? Because you're using the same cells. But how about you think about like what what do you think about kind of like tumor heterogeneity in this kind of model? Yeah, you mean different types of yeah, degrees? like different type of mutations within the same yeah. cancer types and things yeah, like that. it's a great question. So it turned out when we were um, doing different debris and we put them into mice missing different host systems, we saw differences. Like lymphoma debris, EL4 debris, uh, was dependent on T cells. When we put that particular debris system into athymic mice, we found differences. So in Megan's paper, we actually focused on debris where the uh, adaptive immune system didn't really have a role where we knew we went into skid mice or athymic mice and we still saw stimulation of tumor growth. But now we're starting to focus and there's other debris like I didn't get into lymphoma debris 
uh, prednisone debris with lymphoma, for example, where it clear cut the T cells have a role. And we know that because when we do the same model system from C57 mice, you can get C57 athymic mice from Jackson and you do the same system and you suddenly you see no stimulation of tumor growth. So it does look like it depends on the tumor type and even the particular therapy. So cytotoxic chemotherapy was more potent with tamoxifen and cetuximab or Latin, and we had to go to much higher concentrations. So that particular degree less, seems less potent as chemotherapy. Um, but yeah, we're starting to go into different debris. Uh, so we do see some debris that don't stimulate. When we did tamoxifen, we ER negative tumor, and it was just non, basically it was this uh, non-specific debris, we didn't see stimulation. And it turns out also, we're interested, if you do the debris ahead of time, like a vaccine model, debris can actually be an anti-tumor. So it depends on the model, because there's a whole field of immunogenic cytotoxic cell death, and those are the ones who have clinical trials of immunotherapy and chemotherapy going at the same time. So there are models where you use the debris as a, basically as a vaccine, um, and they kill using radiation, you know, the dead cells. So um, we're kind of playing around with the models. It turns out this reverse phenomenon, you have to co-inject the same time at the same site, the tumor cell and the debris. If you inject them at different sites, you don't see it as much. And reverse, if you go back to his papers, that's what they showed too. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's gonna depend on the particular tumor type. Yeah. Uh, Apec, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm kind of curious about the anti-inflammatory effects of EETs in the tumor microenvironment be contrasted with the cell intrinsic production of EETs that can promote tumor growth? And how do you um, reconcile that? Is it tumor type dependent? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what, it's basically been kind of a huge problem in the field because we actually had a JCI paper where we showed that the ETs are pro-angiogenic and pro-stimulatory. Um, I think what, it may be a dose thing where the SH inhibitors at a lower dose you, you see the anti-inflammation more than the pro-angiogenic, but at the high, really high doses, you get the pro-angiogenic. We quite honestly, we were shocked when this data with the SCH inhibitor, for those of you not in the field, the huge, when our JCI paper came out in 2012 and based on David's work too, many companies were scared. I mean, this is a whole pathway where you can block inflammation in 30 different diseases. SCH inhibitors are now being targeted in a clinic. But what companies were scared is this proangiogenic could stimulate tumor dormancy escape. In fact, our paper in 2012 was called epoxy eicosanoid to stimulate tumor dormancy escape. So the companies actually approached us like, would you give these compounds, which are great for hypertension, diabetes, neuropathy, eye disease? You can think of every 30 different inflammatory diseases, but then the companies are worried, do they stimulate dormancy escape? So we've been working with them and we still a little bit don't exactly understand why the, the SCH inhibitor at lower doses would be more anti-inflammatory and the higher doses are more pro-angiogenic. But the one, the own one that I just showed was Bruce's most recent SCH inhibitor and it pretty much wiped out the pro-angiogenic cytokine. So it seems anti-angiogenic. Um, so when Dr. Fogan was around, there are these, um, there's a phenomenon called hormesis where it just depends on where on the U-shaped curve you are. So that's another possibility that it makes things a little complicated, but it the same compound can be pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic depending on where you are on that curve. So that may be another possibility, but a lot of, a lot of work to be done because as you know, your papers and Dao Wen's papers show that increase the epoxygenases in the tumor cells, you would get a pro-tumor phenotype. Yeah. In, in the chemotherapy-induced um, debris models, when you think about treating an intact host, you're also actually suppressing the, the inflammatory cells themselves, you know, so you get some substantial decreases in hematopoietic cells, all the things that are the effectors. So how do those two things balance? Um, the fact that you're generating debris, but that you're also decreasing the numbers of cells that will respond to the cytokine. Yeah, we haven't looked into it. It's a great, great question. So I was just thinking of an experiment. Have you ever put a, a million cells on one side of the animal and a, a thousand cells on the other side and just treated them with chemotherapy to see if the thousand side will? Yeah, just the tumor cells, you mean? Yeah, with just the tumor the, cells, because you'll kill the big one. Yeah, no, it's a great one. experiment. We have done flank tumors when we were looking at inhibitors. So in the Falkman lab, that's how angiostatin 
all the inhibitors were discovered because you put two flank tumors and you see just one tumor suppress the other one. And if you see it like a big tumor, a little tumor, that means the, um, little, um, the big tumor is suppressing the little tumor. And so there's an inhibitor involved. So we've done flank experiments with inhibitors, but not with the debris, not an, an, answering your question. Uh, but it's a, it's a great experiment. We haven't looked into that. Other questions or comments? Okay, let's thank Dr. Panagraf. Thank you.